All right, Bob, let's answer patron emails. What do you say? I say let's answer those patron emails. Listener Dallas, she writes in and says, I want to help my husband open up emotionally, Mm -hmm. but I'm not sure how. Mm -hmm. I love my husband, and we have a great relationship. He has a lot of trauma from his childhood, but Mm -hmm. toxic masculinity won't let him express it. Mm -hmm. He assumes the worst out of people, and it has taken him a lot to see how much that I love him. Mm -hmm. I want to help him open up and express what he's going through when he's having a hard time. By the way, I plan on having us watch The Mask We Wear. I will update you after we watch it. So, end of email. The Mask We Wear is a really great documentary about masculinity. Oh. Uh, Told, you know, they interview men of various different cultural pockets and they dismantle masculinity and identify the toxic elements of masculinity pretty effectively. Oh, right on. And. I've prescribed it to clients to watch before. So uh, that's Dallas is responding because I think I must have mentioned it and Dallas has mentioned it. But anyway, Dallas's question is, I want to help my husband open up emotionally. He has a lot of trauma, but toxic masculinity gets in the way. What advice do you have to Dallas? Hmm. Well, I always think of listening. Listening is a really good way to help somebody feel safe to open up. And listening is not just sit there silently stare at them. Listening is taking an interest in where they're at, including I'm not being open. Like what a fabulous thing to make room for. Like, yeah, I don't feel safe to be open and that's okay. Like I, as a listener, as a person on the other end of that, I can be interested and okay. So when I think about listening, I often think it's kind of like taking a guided tour where you're on the tour and you're the guide is telling you, you don't interrupt the guide and say, well, you know, the Mona Lisa, blah, 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 blah. You just listen to what the tour guide tells you about the Mona Lisa. Or when you're in the river, you just go where the river goes. You don't tell the river it ought to turn left when it's turning right. And you have that possibility. So even accepting that he exercises his freedom to be quiet and to have that be acceptable to you might itself have a paradoxical effect. Mm -hmm. Right. You mentioned safety and that is the key is that people want to share themselves. People want to be vulnerable, but they will avoid it because they don't feel safe. And so that's the thing you really want to focus on. Uh, What else would you say though? Because I'm guessing for Dallas, she would say, well, that's all fine and good. I, I can be like, I'm on a tour and there's a tour guide. Sure. But he never talks, <laughs> so he never expresses himself. What am I? And he and I see him suffering in his uh, with his issues, yeah. and he gets triggered a lot. And then he doesn't talk about it, and right. I, I can see it, and I think he can kind of see it, but he never talks. What could I do? Well, you could do two things. One is you could take yourself off a clock which is that's going to unfold at the pace that that needs to unfold at and it might not be the pace that you wish for. Mm. And the other thing you could do is you could be interested in what comes up for you when you notice that he's triggered or that he's locked up. What actually does come up for you, you can always look at and work with that. And it actually might be interesting. Work with it with him or on our own? Both. Yeah. Yeah. My advice, Dallas, similar to Bob's, is it's... First off, it's tough. Uh, yeah. it, we could provide tips. Yeah. And yes. that's all fine and good. But right. for people in Dallas's shoes, as I'm guessing other people listening are as well, it is, it's tough. You have a partner who you understand has good reasons to be, uh, to feel unsafe with vulnerability and to have toxic masculine ideas of independence and toughness and, yeah. and self reliance and lack of emotion and terrifying notions of vulnerability. And you can see it, but to get someone to talk, so to speak, or to get someone to open up or to help someone to feel comfortable with their emotions, you could do everything right for the rest of your relationship, you know, over the next 40, 50 years, and maybe just put a minor dent in that problem. It is uh, pervasive in the personality. 
it can be very difficult for people given their traumas. And it largely relies on the individual. You can do yeah. well, you can do a lot from the outside, but ninety nine percent of the change is going to be generated in part by the motivation of the individual. They have to set their sights on it. They have to say, "Yeah, I want to be more vulnerable. I want. I, I don't. I don't like the idea of it." And I've and I've been with clients as they go through this, men in particular, but you know, people of all genders, where. For months, I evaluate, and then another set of months, I explain and point out instances to convince the individual that their problem, one of their main problems, is a a fear of vulnerability. And that fear of vulnerability leads to uh, certain defenses and ideas that results in not getting your needs met. And so trying to uh, convince them of that can take a long time. And then for some of those clients, eventually they get to a place where they are properly convinced and they're like, yeah, I'm going to set my sights on it. And then we've got years of therapy ahead of us. And that person is convinced, you know, they're, they're like, yeah, I see you've, you've shown me the light. I do need to be vulnerable. That is the key to my problems and my retraction from vulnerability causes so many problems in my life that I, I wasn't consciously aware of. And, uh, and then it's years of therapy of, of, uh, of trying to do that. So, yeah. uh, being a spouse, uh, is, you know, it's, it's going to be tough. So, so, so that one, two, as Bob was saying, it takes time. You got to be patient, yeah. uh, take yourself off the clock as Bob says for sure. Um, obviously therapy could help. Um, also lead by example mm-hmm. is another thing you can do is to be as differentiated as you can. Uh, Bowen believed that if someone is differentiated, it will pull a system towards differentiation to the point where Bowen actually, when eventually he got to a point in family therapy that he would try to identify the most differentiated person in a family and he would work one-on-one with them so that that person would go back into the family system and be as differentiated as possible. And it would cause everyone to be more differentiated with their emotions and stuff. But anyway, that's fascinating. The other part of it is, uh, the last thing I'll say is to what Bob was getting at is to speak his feelings for him within reason. Mm -hmm. Uh, So this might sound like, well, that doesn't sound right, but I've done this many times in therapy and I will with fellows like people like this is they'll come in, for example, and they'll be angry at those. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I want a divorce. You know, my, my marriage, we, we had a huge fight over the weekend. This is ridiculous. And, and I, I just, I'm done with this whole thing. And I might say, well, how are you feeling? Uh, I, I'm just, I'm just done. You know, I'm just, I'm at the, my wits end. Well, what's your emotions? How, how are you, you know, what were you feeling over the weekend? Oh, you know, just just like done, man. I'm just, I'm just over this shit. Okay. So, you know, just rinse and repeat that question of like, well, what's, what's the, what are you feeling in your body? Um, and nothing comes out. And eventually I'll say like, well, front and then say they describe like a lot of conflict and, and I'm, I'm surmising that he was hurt. That is that his spouse hurt his feelings. And so I might say, I surmise based on your description that your feelings were hurt and that that was really painful. I mean, if I were in your shoes, I I think I would have felt really hurt. And then that would cause me to want to retract and to get away from all that because that doesn't feel good. And then I might go into a fantasy in my head of divorce, which is a relief to the pain. So this is me just telling a client what they are feeling or what they likely are feeling. And we, we want to avoid that usually, but I think under certain circumstances, it, if you do it right and you don't just assume or tell someone it is a, it's the only way I have found in some circumstances to at least raise the possibility instead of Socratically, just keep asking the question, you know, it's just like you keep running up against the wall. Sometimes you have to prime the pump, you know? Yeah. And as a spouse, I imagine you could do that too. You could say like, so I, I imagine what's happening for you is that you're really hurt. I, if I were in your shoes and 
my dad did that to me, I'd be hurt by that. Uh, Drop my phone. <laughs> Pops. Pops. I don't know if anyone heard that, but Pops phone just fell on the ground. <laughs> um, and that can help as well. All right. Next email. Listener Emmy says, what do you do as a therapist when you see a client denying they said something you heard them say in session? Bob, what do you say? Well, I don't know. That's a really interesting question. I'm not sure I bumped up against that in, at work. When, when a client says, denies saying something that they said, well, I could imagine times in the past when I've like, you know, picked up the other end of the rope and started tugging like, well, yeah, you said it. Well, no, I didn't. Well, yeah, you did. I could imagine that there's times in the past when I've done that. Um, I'd like to think that um, I could at least point it out like, oh, well, maybe I got it wrong. You know, what I thought I heard was thus and such. Are you saying that that's, I didn't hear that. You're saying, oh, you're saying I didn't hear that. Oh, okay. Well, well can you help me get it then? What, what did I miss? Or what am I, where am I lost? I want to understand. Right. Yeah. Not get hung up on right or wrong yeah. or what someone said. Yeah. It's, it's not really it's important. Not. Yeah. This is something that occasionally comes up. People ask about and therapy is at least Bob and my style is not about catching people on their BS, no. so to speak. You know, have you ever done it though? Um, I I'm have. sure I have. Ugh. Yeah. Well, so what just popped into my head was I had, well, I'll say generally speak, because it has happened more than once, clients who were in the midst of cheating in the moment oh, uh -huh. and hadn't told their spouse about oh, it. Oh, yeah. And I listened, and you know, I, it's, it's their life, and it's their marriage, and sure. what's it to me? And so I listen. But then eventually I would get to this point where I, I'd say, you know, how do you feel about it? You know, like, what's, what's your plan? And for some people... I believe they go into a self-serving denial space of just like everything's fine, essentially, you know, without going into specifics about what might be said. And I'll say, well, that doesn't make any sense to me <laughs> <laughs> because you're lying by omission yeah. in one of the most uh, fundamental ways. And it's incredibly self-serving to act like this is okay. And unless you're some kind of psychopath, which I don't think you are, I'm sure you're going against the grain regarding your own values. So uh, I, I don't buy it. So that happens pretty rare. Yeah, right. Uh, but it has happened, and, and I'll say that. Um, but, yeah, generally speaking, uh, clients don't at least, well, I guess if I think back to the, my, the beginning of my career i worked with a lot of kids and teenagers oh. who didn't want to be in therapy right. by the way yeah. <laughs> and would absolutely deny in fact one of my i don't know if you want to call it like a seminal client that i kind of um developed a lot of my abilities with oh right on he was i don't know maybe like 10 or 12 and i I worked so hard with him and he did not want to be in therapy and he hated doing therapy and we would play games for the first bit of time. And then I would say, okay, now that we've played games, we have to do therapy. And he'd be like, oh, okay. And he'd roll his eyes <laughs> and it was pulling teeth. It was so hard. Sure. And I can't even remember what we were working on. It was probably some kind of behavioral problem at school at home or something. And every once in a while at the very end of a session, he would relent and become vulnerable and differentiated and say something to the effect of, yeah, you know what? I think I do that sometimes. I will become defensive or because of my issues, I'll exaggerate something here or there. Or, uh, or I learned today that maybe if I think a little bit before I act, it'll help me out a little bit or something. I don't know or I need relationship, some, something that I was like, oh, we fight. And it, it was so hard to get him there. And then the next session, I would say, so remember you said that last session, you'd be like, I didn't say, that. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and this happened over and over and over again. Uh -huh. And eventually I got to a place where I would write down word for word verbatim oh. what he said. Uh -huh. So we would get to that point. Yeah. I would finally get him to that point. I'd be like, okay, so I'm gonna write down on a, 
piece of paper in your file and it's gonna be things that you said. So what did you just say? It'd be like D, 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 and I'd write out the sentence. And then the next session, halfway through the session, you know, we'd be playing games and I'd switch to therapy and I'd say, okay, so remember last session you said blank. He's like, I didn't say that. And I was like, okay, I'm pulling out the paper. I literally wrote down word for word. And I, you know, I think it was his defensive style was just to go into denial Deny. about that sort of thing. Sure. And must have been modeled that or something. And so that's what I did. But that was very uh, odd therapeutic situation. You know, that I, that of the, I don't know, a couple thousand of clients I've worked with, that's the only one that I can think of that I would you that I'd be that concerned about quote unquote catching someone on a lie or denial mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, but to answer your question, additionally, Emmy, you're saying, you know, what do you do as a therapist when a client is denying what they said uh, in therapy mm -hmm. is in th the first thing that comes to mind that's most frequent is in couples therapy when you have partners who will say, you said this, no, I didn't say that, that kind of stuff. And, and oh, yeah, right. And All that's, the time. Yeah, that's normal. Yep. It's emotional remembering. We don't, we're not a tape recorder. We right. filter everything, both coming in and coming out through our emotions and our preferences. And and so there's that. The other thing is shame lying. People will lie out of shame because they, or they will shame remember. <laughs> they will shame forget, I guess, uh, uh, things that we did that we regret in a fight with our spouse right. the next day we're just like I didn't do that even though if you really thought about it you're like oh I think I did do that mm -hmm. um, And but the main thing that I will say is just reflecting what Bob said is I would assume that I, I had it wrong yeah. <laughs> like if anyone remembers more about their sessions it's it's the clients you know I, I I've had a lot of sessions in my life whereas right clients only have a certain amount of sessions and they remember things much better than I do. So I would just assume that I, I was wrong. Anyway, yeah. uh, next question here. Listener Paul from New York says, I listened to your recent podcast where you talked about the importance of mentors oh. for therapists. I'm yeah. wondering if you could talk about mentorship in general and what it offers to both the mentor and the mentee. I can't really say I ever had a positive experience with an older or more experienced person in my life. Oh. How does one form relationships like mentorships? Bob, what do you think? Well, choose carefully, right? Those that we wish to um, learn from, we ought to choose carefully. Um, every therapist I've ever had, and there have been many, probably a dozen, maybe 15, um, has at least at some point um, been uh, a model for me. So I channel them actually is what I find myself doing is I channel the people who's, who I respect, who I'm relying on to help me. And they are a source of their resource for me when I'm working with my clients. So my theoretical perspective and my point of view and the things that I focus on will actually shift depending on what's going on in my personal counseling and who I'm seeing, because, you know, as therapists, we all have our own ideas, right? So Another way that I've done that is I've just sort of, when I was learning DBT, I just watched video of Marsha teaching. Just watch Mar video of Marsha teaching. And she didn't like it when I said it, but she's everybody's grandma when she's teaching. When I said that to her, she stuck her foot up on the table and she said, look at these shoes. These are sexy shoes. These are not grandma shoes. And I was like, yes, I'm sorry. Right. But she is. Wait, what? Start over. So, so when she's teaching, it's like coming into your grandma's house for Thanksgiving dinner when you uh -huh. come, when you're going to one of her skills, skills groups, right? Uh -huh. That's what you would think in your mind. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Cause, cause she's very validating and she's really warm. And the way she says, it's like Thanksgiving dinner. I offer you the potatoes. And if you turn them down, it's like, that's okay. Later, I'm going to offer you some Turkey. And if you turn it down, that's okay. Later, I'm going to come back with cranberries. And if you turn it down, that's okay. And that's her whole attitude towards clients so that they feel safe because people are going to do their best learning if they're feeling comfortable and safe. Yeah. So, She's really warm. It's a compelling metaphor as well that one is offering potatoes when the client feels like you're offering barbed wires. Yeah, right. 
Yeah, right, right. Well, it helps if I believe that that's what I'm doing. And a lot of that's going to be in my attitude. So basically what I did is I channeled her. I, in fact, I started acting like her and she calls everybody dear, which was a hard one for me to swallow. But I did. I started calling my clients dear. Um, and at the time I was learning from her, I was 37. So <laughs> talking like a grandma. Um, and after a while, I just developed my own attitude and my, my, my own style with warmth and the same kind of demeanor. Because but then if, when did the shoes come in? Oh, because I mentioned it at a meeting. I'm like, yeah, you're like everybody's favorite grandma. She's like, I am not everybody's favorite grandma. And she sticks her foot on the table and she's like, these shoes are sexy. I'm like, oh, yeah, they are, right? Oops. That's funny. Yeah, I guess, I guess sometimes people don't want to be thought of as grandparently. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. of age or because of vibe? Like she... Th- because it's interesting, I, I she, think age. she didn't. Well, but she said "sexy." You know what I mean. Yeah. So maybe she sees herself yeah. back then as someone that was more right, like sexy. Yeah, more like a, I don't know, more in the mix of that kind of energy rather than right what some people might perceive grandmas to be not in. I yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. So, yeah. so that particular image, yeah, she didn't love that. Um, but what I what I did is I just simply became her as as I understand her and act like her and um, even use her language until I developed the attitude. And I've done that many times along the way with with other folks. So Marsha was a mentor to you. Yes. And how did you notice that, develop it, use it? You know, what were, what were the steps? Because yeah. she could have just been someone that was teaching you and not a mentor. It's true. So what did you do from your side yeah. to cultivate that? Well, at that clinic, they video record everything. So I simply watched hours and hours of her teaching, which was my job there was to teach those classes. So I watched her do it and it was really good. Cause what I, you know, learning something is kind of like understanding and coming to coming to understand that you have bad breath, but you just can't smell your own. Because when I, she hired me, I thought, oh, yeah, I know how to do this job. I've been doing it for three, four years. I know my way around. And then I started watching video of a master. And I'm like, oh, yeah. So sounds like for you, step yeah. one was being open to yeah. the idea oh. that someone else might know more than you. Yeah. And so you have to also imagine that maybe you don't know everything. Yeah. Well, I, that's easy for me. I'm, I'm totally cool with not knowing everything. But not everyone is good at that. That would be an important skill to, if you want a mentor, it'd probably be important to let go of being an expert right? and let yourself be a student. Yeah. So there's a bit of humbleness with that, some humility, um, openness, willingness, um, experimentation, um, willing to look at and own up to mistakes and all that good stuff that helps anybody learn anything. And then once you had a relationship with Marsha, did you kind of step into it a little bit, like try to have more um, interactions with her? No. No, I used her as a model for how to teach that class, but I didn't enter into um, a mentorship beyond that. But I have had that with, um, uh, in particular, a supervisor I, I knew for many, many years, David Taylor, lovely man. I learned a lot from him about therapy. (laughs) <laughs> one time I'm in the middle of a session and I'm like, David, I'm, I don't know if I can help this client. I'm like, like, I think I'm a step behind him. And he said, Bob, that's, what's great about being a therapist is you're always on your growth edge. That's a good thing. Right. He had that kind of playful, um, adventurous spirit that I was like a little bit tight and scared. And I learned, um, flexibility and a little bit of humor uh, from him and um, softness. Uh, I learned a lot of that about that from him. How did you find him? Because there was, was a time when you didn't know no, him. You didn't. I was really lucky. He got hired as my supervisor at the clinic where I did my internship and then got a job. I was a job there and he got hired there. And then he became my, at some point he became my boss. And so after and then the clinic i think mismanaged him and um got rid of him and i kept him though i worked with him for 10 years after that i just would visit him in his 
um, actually at first we started meeting at a coffee shop, but then I started visiting him in the, in his private practice office every week and we'd talk about cases and he'd help me and you pay him. Oh yeah. Yeah. Paid him. It was paid right. supervision. Yeah. Yeah. So I think Paul from New York, you're hearing Bob lay out some elements that can help. Uh, Bob was open. Bob was saying, I don't know everything. Other people with more experience probably know more than I do. I'm going to, and Bob isn't saying this explicitly, but what I'm hearing is once a good mentor comes along, you really latch on to that person with your supervisor. That There's that story. But even with Marsha, you're saying, I started to just watch a lot of tapes. Yeah, That was voluntary. You didn't yes. have to do that. No. And so you were in a mindset of this is a mentor. This is someone that yeah. I need to absorb. And it doesn't happen all the time. No. So once you find one, you have to, you know, use them well. Yeah. Uh, so there's that. Other things that I say is, because you're saying, Paul, you're not a therapist. And, and you're just wondering, like, oh. how, do you be, how do you just get a mentor in life or in another, oh. another industry? I, I think I was presuming Paul's a therapist. I was yeah. looking for supervision. Yeah, is find a venue where your mentors might be. Yeah. Because if you're just yeah. at home or you're at a job where it's the same boss and that boss isn't a very good mentor, yeah, then you might not ever come across someone who might be a good candidate. Right. So good venues are, you know, work maybe. Maybe you have to go to another department to find a good connection there. Professional organization, perhaps. Okay, yeah. that's a good idea. Yeah, right. And some professional organizations have mentor programs yeah uh, mine you know washington association of marriage and family therapy we have a thing called mentor day once a year where you can actually hook up with mentees and mentors wow um school obviously yeah going to school right fellow students maybe but obviously awesome. professors can become mentors family members can become mentors mm -hmm. i had a brief mentor relationship with my granddad who oh. uh, helped me with understanding early career mindset. Oh, wow. The, the, and I've talked about this before, but yeah. the, the thing that he, that really helped me at the time was because he was a very successful contractor in Spokane. And, to, and I always, I only, I was born when he was already very successful. And so I only knew him as this extremely ex successful sort of top of the heap is that your mom's dad or your dad's my, dad? My, my white grandfather, yeah. yeah. And he uh, he was so prominent and well-known that he was man of the year by the main uh, Spokane newspaper. You know, it's, wow. it's sort of like, it's a huge, he wasn't just like a contractor. You know, he was like a, a figure in, in the community. Community, yeah. yeah. In the 50s, 60s, 70s. Wow. And I always saw him as this as this very i don't know respected successful person but and i just graduated with my bachelor's degree right. and i was having trouble finding a good job that fit what i thought i qualified for because right. you know i had a i had a bachelor's degree from university of washington it was it was in business and and there was all this talk about like you know be, becoming a marketing manager or becoming a a a CPA or, you know, these, mm. you know, job jobs. Yeah. And I could not find the only things I could find were, I mean, I got a job at Foot Locker, Foot Locker. selling uh, shoes, <laughs> which, and it was a terrible job, very low pay, very difficult. And you could do that without a high school diploma. Sure. And I'm just trying to figure out like, how is this happening to yeah. me? And he, and there were a lot of reasons why I was stupid in that moment. But one of them was that, um, that my granddad pointed out was that he said, when I started out, I started out as a cement mixer, which means he's saying, I started out in my career at the very lowest point on a construction site, just mixing the cement, which in, in his time, in his telling me, that was the lowest of the low. Uh -huh. you, you you weren't even a ditch digger at that point. You're just you're just mixing the cement, uh -huh. and he, he you know talked with me for a long time about that. But and it really shifted my approach, and I was like, oh, that makes sense. Right. 
start at the bottom, work your way up. Who yeah. am I? You know, I'm, I'm 22. Sure. I have a bachelor's degree, but that doesn't mean anything. Everyone starts at the bottom. And so it, it really set me on a, another mindset that, uh, you know, contributed to me, uh, having a much more satisfactory career Oh, right on. and a, approach of building rather than just jumping into midstream in a career. You know what I mean? Yep. So you can have family members. The other thing is internships, regardless of what industry you work in, there are often internships that you can even manufacture. You can just go to someone's like, could I just intern for you? Uh, like podcasting, for example, if you want to start a podcast, Find another podcast that you love and just say, hey, I'd love to work for you for free five hours a week. Put me to work. Even if it's just like doing mon- mundane things, you, you'll learn. You'll pick, you'll pick up on stuff. And the, the person that is your manager for the internship will often, you'll develop a friendship and you'll just end up you know, talking about things and you'll get mentorship from that person. Right. The other thing is to, once you do find you're in a venue, you got to reach out. Uh, because uh, for me, I come across a lot of students and some of them I will reach out to me and literally even ask me, can, can you be my mentor? Or I really like your approach and would like to absorb more of that. Can we talk more? You know, this kind of thing. And it's uh, whereas other students, the vast majority of students never do that either because they don't want me as their mentor, which is probably the main reason. But, but there's also, I think people who will, the dog is barking, who will do that, who won't reach out because they don't feel entitled. They feel like they shouldn't, or they feel like they're going to bother professors. And I'm here to tell you that most people have time and the desire to mentor but people don't approach them. Mm -hmm. So if you find someone, give it a shot. I will say I regret, and I know some of you are listening, students have reached out to me as of late for mentorship, and I have said, I can't, I don't have the time. You don't have the time. (laughs) I did in the past, but I don't know. Um, The other thing is to maybe capitalize on formal uh, superiors, uh, supervisors, this kind of thing. But Paul, what you're saying is, you're saying, I can't really say I ever had a positive experience with an older or more experienced person in my life. You know, it's possible that you have relational traumas that, for good reasons, close you off to authority mm. um, and or make you uh, skeptical. And that's one thing that if if that is the problem, you might want to consider addressing. Yeah. All right, let's take a break. We get back. More questions. What do you say, Bob? I say Yes. All right, we're back from the break. Famous patron Alexis, the person that you had an awkward <laughs> moment on stage with. Hi, Alexis. Uh, and uh, famous patron Alexis says, Hi, Kirk and Bob. I just listened to your episode about abusive bosses. I had a boss for a year during the pandemic who was completely abusive. Ugh. He was mean and sexist. Ugh. He scrutinized everything that I did. Mm. Uh, if I questioned any of his decisions, he would tell me I was negative and aggressive. Oh. Eventually, he was let go. Yeah. I find myself even now questioning my behavior, though, and scrutinizing every email before I send it off, worrying it could be picked apart by a supervisor and used against me like it was before. All this to say, I'm glad you said something about how being mistreated at work isn't normal and you don't deserve it. Yeah. Yeah. It's something that... Uh, I noticed early on in my career, not only with work, but also in bands like musical groups that we uh, will say, well, in a marriage, if you're not getting along, maybe go to therapy, right? Um, uh, There still isn't enough of that, but at least there's, you'll find that people say, wow, you're almost divorcing. Maybe you should go to couples therapy. But if you have a major problem with someone at work or a major problem with someone in a band that you're in, or a major problem with a friend, I guess, by by extension. Uh, no one ever thinks or suggests going to therapy, and why not? Uh, it, I've and I've often thought like, if every workplace had a therapist for every I don't know twenty or thirty employees, wow, 
productivity would skyrocket. Uh, 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 job satisfaction would skyrocket. All these, and, I, and they do this. It's not like it's unheard of. It does happen, but it's so rare. And it makes total sense, right? I mean, think about all the times, Bob, you've had a conflict with someone that you worked with. I mean, you've been in private practice for a long time. Sure. You can imagine times when you had some kind of conflict with a boss or a coworker or something or an uncomfortable moment or yeah. a moment where you're like, did something weird happen there? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yes. And you don't have any, uh, or the, tr the options available to you are not very great. But imagine if you had someone that was an expert on how to help people talk about their feelings and how to help people understand each other. And it was a confidential space, uh, this sort of thing. Safe, right? Yeah. Uh, just imagine what that would do. If it were really safe, I could imagine that being beneficial. Right. It'd have to be. But of course, what often happens, because what they'll say is, well, you got HR. Oh, no. But a lot of HR is just a, it's just an arm of administration. Yes. They're not out for the, they're they not are. there to help the employee. They are not. They're there to impose the administration's will on the employee. Not always, of course. There are HR people who are absolutely. We're not saying HR people or the administration's agenda is a bad thing. We're saying it isn't necessarily um, in line with what an employee would need or want. Yeah. It often is not. Yeah, <laughs> I my, agree. Most of, I'd say most of the time it isn't. <laughs> right. Usually it, admin is about exploitation, which makes sense. You know, sure. that they're trying to raise their, uh, they're trying to lower the bottom line. Is that what they're trying? They're trying to lower costs yeah. and increase productivity. And right. so there's a natural uh, tension between right. labor and administration but, and, and HR has bosses, which is administration, you know, right. HR, they're not, they're not employed by the plebes. They are, they're employed by the aristocrats of the organization. Anyway. Right. Um, so there's that. And another aspect that I think we talked about was if you talk about a marriage that is going badly, uh, people are like, Oh, that sounds really rough. You talk about a relationship with a boss that's going badly. People are like, well, why didn't you just quit? You know, yeah, this guy right. is simplistic. Sort of dis dismissive. Yeah. Instead of recognizing that it's uh, a very, very can be important relationship. The oh, relationship you have man. with your boss or a coworker. Yeah. You, for some people, you're more involved, you know, hours wise and dependency wise with your coworker or your boss than you would ever be with your spouse. So um, I think it's time that we recognize that mm -hmm. and, and, appreciate that and do something about it because people deserve that. You know, people deserve, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had horrible relationships with bosses and had zero ability to do anything about it. Right. Uh, but imagine if I could just go to a therapist and be like, so my boss just yelled at me. Could, could we pull in the boss and actually have a conversation about what just happened? Yeah. I right. don't, you know, it, I think it would help. So the, one of the things that occurs to me about what Alexis is writing is, you know, like it's a trauma response, like once bitten, twice shy, like who right. wouldn't be? And then the other thing is that stands out is, you know, it's a misogynistic world. And so if you're a woman, you actually have to be more aware of, I'm not saying this is right. I'm saying that in order to survive in the world of business, you often have to be more aware of the way you're perceived more than a man, man would have to be. My wife was just telling me about this the other day. She was taking a vacation and then one of her co-workers was you know wanted to go on the vacation with her as a man this is long before she met me and um she had to tell her boss that we're going on this vacation but it's just platonic just so that the boss wouldn't have some kind of misidea about what was happening there among his um employees his direct reports because she had to protect herself. My wife worked at a bank, which is, you know, white man privilege dominated. So she was, you know, she would face mis misogyny and sexism all the time. And so um, perhaps, I don't know what Alexis does, but perhaps there's an element of that. There's certainly an element of that in the culture and at large, perhaps an element of that in the world, in the place that she works, which makes me sad. Yeah, it is very obvious that in a lot if not all workplaces there is sexism and misogyny yeah. and that when women are um you know have legit complaints right. 
or legit ideas right. that they are not regarded in the same way, generally speaking, as when a man is speaking. Yeah. And I didn't see that early in my career, no, but started to at, at my university over time. And it was a stark contrast, particularly because most of the students and the professors were women. Right. And yet, so it was, it was so obvious that the few men, including myself, got like so much more respect mm. than women did. Uh, the most obvious example was professors. We would all be in the same room having a conference about whatever. And one of the women professors would talk about how they had an incident with a student. And they'd say, yeah, so the student did this, student did that. And I, right. and I would be shocked at what students that I knew, how they'd be treating my colleagues. Whoa. And I thought, and I, I remember in the beginning, I was like, they did what to you? <laughs> they said what to you? Sometimes literally violence, by the way. Like there were students who were violent to oh. female uh, instructors. Uh, not often, of course, but oh, it happens. God. And I was astonished because not only had I not seen that from students towards me, but I'd never even seen anything close to that. And at first I was just shocked. I was like, well, what is happening? And then over time I started to see this pattern of it was the women instructors that were talking about this atrocious behavior. And I was like, wow. I mean, as a guy myself, I just get this automatic pass that yeah. my colleagues just don't get. Right. And, and I think what it has to do with is because I fit the mold of a proper professor in you know, societal's eye, oh, society's right. eyes sure. as a man, that when I say things that are stupid, which I do at times, <laughs> people give me the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Also, when I rub people wrong, people make excuses for me. They'll just be like, well, I'm, I'm sure you know he'll figure it out, or maybe he misspoke, or maybe he just didn't learn that bit yet. He's, but he's, you know, uh, uh, the, the gift of charity is given a lot, right? Of, well, I'm sure he meant well, that kind of thing. <laughs> and I remember thinking about this about male professors myself. You mm -hmm. know, they would say something about like, well, you know, he's older, he's probably kind of set in his ways. Whereas a woman says it, you're like, wait a second, you're not supposed to say that kind of thing. And so it was, um, you know, interesting to experience that. And so, yeah, Alexis, you might be, you probably are experiencing at least some of that sort of thing. You remember that first night of grad school for us? And that fellow came in and listening to the marriage game. Was that his the headphones? first class? Our very first class. I didn't know that. First. I mean, I, I barely remember that. You remember it much clearer than I. Yeah. So we had a very. <sighs> We had a, apparently it was our first uh, day in graduate school. Very yeah. tense because we're all terrified and we're also giddy with excitement. Right. With I think it was everybody's first night of school. Okay. And it, it was ProSem, which was a very personal class of right. only like seven students. Yeah. And, and we sat in a circle yep. with, with no table and we talked about our feelings and about what it was to be a therapist yeah. and how to listen and how right. to have empathy and this kind of thing. And, and so you couldn't just sit in the back of a 50 person class and listen to no. a Mariners game. If you're listening to a Mariners game with an earbud, which was very strange at the time, uh -huh. uh, and you're going to be noticed by everyone there. Including, uh, so, so what happened? So remember our teacher was a woman, Flora, yeah. lovely. Um, and she just said, take, take, take that off, put yeah. it away. And, I remember him saying something confrontive, like not, not like hostile, but not overtly so. And I think when he introduced himself, he mentioned what he mentioned. I'll never forget this: uh, is that he noticed that there was a certain um, hostility towards men <laughs> at school because he had finished his bachelor's degree there. Oh, and so then was starting. Um, I never liked him. I didn't like him. I don't, he didn't finish. I think he got booted. Right. Um, 
which I think was a good call because oh yeah, he was not, he had multiple problems, lots of problems. I think he, I think he got booted after his first quarter because I think in our second quarter he wasn't with us anymore. No, he was. Oh, he was. Yeah, he was in our ethics class. Oh, which was not first quarter. That was second or third. Oh, with uh, Sandra Lippincott. Yeah. Oh, I liked her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I remember. I don't the, remember ethics class. Oh, there was a he had a debate about. Um, was I in the class? Yeah. Oh. He had this. He got in this debate with somebody else. Maybe it might have been me too. Yeah, it was partly me about you know where the limits are in a professional relationship and how far one could or should go versus when one should um, observe one limits. And he was basically advocating for you shouldn't have any. Meaning you could have sex with your clients. Not that kind of limit. Like if they need you, you should be there, even at the expense of other clients or your own personal life or whatever. And huh, interesting. Yeah. Which is really nuts. Anyways. Um, I don't think that he would have behaved that way towards a man. If we had a male teacher, right? I think he would have left that headphone thing aside just as a matter of course. Yeah. But I think it's cause it was a woman that he thought that he was grinding an ax. Apparently. Yeah. I mean, he came in with this idea that men are treated worse. Yeah. <laughs> Like, like, <laughs> which is, which is the, yeah. the first reaction of, um, a man dealing with equality. Yeah. That's it. That's nicely put. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyways it, came to mind. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I ran into Flora a couple years ago, took, took a selfie with her. Aww. And I think there's a picture on Instagram. If you scroll back far enough. Wow. She um, was cool. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I remember her cause I would bump into her a lot because yeah. yeah. I, I, I started teaching right. Pretty, right after graduate school and, and she's been teaching this whole time. She's still teaching. I don't think she does anymore, oh, okay. but she did for, you know, 20 yeah. years maybe after. Wow. And I would bump into her cause she was a big deal to us, right? Uh-huh. She was oh, our yeah. first kind of major instructor sitting in a small circle. Yep. You know, she was, she was very buttoned up in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. She was warm, but she was also very mm-hmm. uh, strong, mm-hmm. I would say, as yeah. an instructor. Yeah. And you just had a lot. She's kind of intimidating. Were you intimidated? Oh, yeah. Yeah. She's a little intimidating. Mm-hmm. And to bump into her later on, it was kind of like, oh, there she, there's Flora Ostro, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I always had the impression that she didn't remember me at all. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Is it true? I don't know. Oh. But I, I, when I was, you know, it wasn't, or she's just kind of that way, just not super personable. Yeah. Right. Because I would say, oh my God, Flora. And she'd be like, hey, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And uh, uh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, it makes sense because for her, how many students did she have oh. at the beginning of their journey? Yeah. Whereas for you and me, oh, we had one, one flora and one she's flora. had hundreds of us. Yeah. Uh, and it's similar true. to me, it's like students will sometimes come up at me, right. at me and they'll be like, oh my God. And I'll, and I can tell like they have a special place in their heart for me as their first quarter instructor. Right. Whereas for me to them, it's just like, well, you, you were, you know, one, one of many who many. came in and out of that turnstile, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> and I I was connected to you at the time, but right. as soon as the quarter was over, I just, I didn't have any contact with you. So it, it just kind of dissipated over time, you know? Right. It's interesting now I think about that. Yeah, because there are classes, pretty much every class I teach, about midway through the quarter, particularly by the end of the quarter, I feel extremely connected to the students. Oh, right on. But after the quarter is done, there's a chance I'll never see him again or think about him or hear from him or anything. And so there's a good chance that I just won't, it'll just fade. It, the, the connection I felt with them will fade. You yeah. Know? Um, which is kind of a bummer. Yeah. Now there are some students that I will retain and, and still do of course. a closeness with. You know? right. anyway. uh, listener Chelsea from New Hampshire says, can you talk about feelings of grief uh, after mutually agreed upon therapy termination? Mm. My therapist and I agreed it was time to end the professional relationship together. Mm. He helped me through a lot. I've grown and it feels 
like the right time to leave. Now I am feeling a lot of sadness and almost feel as if I've lost someone. Yeah. I don't know if it is appropriate to reach out to him about this. I also don't know if after a few weeks it will pass and all will be well. I also don't know. I also don't want to freak him out and make him make it seem like I'm thinking about him too much. I'm feeling a lot of embarrassment and shame for being so attached to him. Mm. Also, like I can't share this also, almost like I can't share this with anyone because of my embarrassment and shame. Oh. Especially because I'm in my early 30s and he is a 60 something year old man. Oh. Is this a relatively typical response to a healthy termination of therapy? Can you talk about this as it relates to forming attachment to your therapist? Bob, what do you think? It sounds normal to me. It sounds like he was really important to you. Um, 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 perhaps, though, I, you know what I know, but perhaps a father figure and a positive one. I, I, I can imagine being really sad about um, the end of your relationship the way you would be sad about the end of any positive important relationship doesn't sound weird to me if you decide to contact him it'd probably be useful if you're real clear about what it is is your goal i don't think there's any getting out of sadness and seeing him um might forestall it but um it's not bad or wrong or dangerous to be sad who wouldn't be yeah yeah the relationship that you had and a lot of people have with their therapist is incredibly deep. Yeah. It is deeper often than any relationship you have with a, you know like a I don't know just like a like a doctor, a physician that you'll have or deeper can be deeper than a friendship, can be deeper than even and more safe than a relationship you had with one of your parents. Yeah. So to feel something after termination would is extremely normal yeah and it's only abnormal because our society is stigmatizing about therapy in general right. and about uh, these kinds of relationships sure. and there's nothing creepy or freaky you know if you had a close relationship with him i suspect that he's the sort of person that would not react negatively no. to you feeling feelings for him yeah. so there's that now i will say some therapists will <laughs> some therapists are not of the mindset that bob and i are mm -hmm. of that uh, clients need to have boundaries of this sort, which uh, they'll, they'll frame it as quote unquote boundaries. But I think what they mean is that's just not the kind of therapy that they want to provide anyway. So totally normal. And it would be strange if you didn't have grief and longing mm. and wanting to reconnect occasionally or something. It'd be yeah. strange if you didn't have that. Uh, you can reach out if you want. He might not respond. You know, some therapist will say, look, we terminated. So um, if I were to re-engage over email or something, I'm opening a can of worms that I might have to eventually draw a boundary around. And, you know, we proper, the, and this is kind of my approach, honestly, is uh, I'd properly terminate at the end. And I will say, I don't always say this because it's not, I don't usually predict it will happen, but if I did, I will say something like, so if you ever reach out to me, know that we have to be very careful about how we communicate because I want, I need to make sure that you understand that we've terminated and that you're no longer under my clinical care. And so if you communicate with me, um, just know that I professionally and ethically, I, I have to think about that and I have to communicate with you about that because some and in my early career this would happen but some therapists will do this is like an old client will reach out to you and they'll be like back and forth maybe even over text and then eventually the client has a bad day and says i'm having a bad day i'm you know i'm feeling suicidal or something well what are you supposed to do as a therapist you're you've now essentially reopened the clinical relationship and you are now responsible for doing something about it, but you're not officially, they haven't signed your disclosure. You don't necessarily know where they live. You know, if you have to call emergency services, um, you might not have space for them. And so you have to be pretty careful about how you do that. Now, a brief check-in like, hey, uh, I'm glad you reached out. Let's just do a, a one-time 15-minute phone call. It won't be clinical. It'll just be like, you know, checking in, um, and we will, and we probably won't ever do it again, or you know, because of da da da. You know, you can put a frame around that kind of check in, but, but anyway, 
uh, you definitely won't freak him out. I don't think. Um, oh, yeah. So, so that's fine. And he'll probably take it as a compliment. I mean, therapists yeah. get into this field because they want to help people. And if you reach out to him and say, Hey, I'm just reflecting on how great our relationship was. I still think about you. I think that would really make his day, if yeah. not his entire career. I mean, yeah. there, there are certain uh, clients that have told me things like that, that I have framed literally and put up on my wall because that's why I got into this. I got into this to develop those kinds of relationships and to have that effect on people. And to get some confirmation of that is the enactment of my purpose. <laughs> so you might uh, be giving him quite a gift by reaching out and saying, I, you know, I think about you and I miss you. And I, I'm glad we terminated, you know, for the reasons we talked about, but I just want you to know that you changed my life and I, I miss you sometimes. And I think about you sometimes and, you know, it could be a, a huge gift that you could give to him. Oh, it's nice. Uh, anonymous listener, in, have you ever done that? Have you ever reached out to a past therapist in that way and just uh, want to check in, that kind of thing? No, I haven't. Yeah, me neither. Doesn't mean anything. Yeah. I mean, I've had contact with former therapists because I might uh, be referring someone to them and we might have a brief kind of email exchange. Or... I become their supervisor <laughs> at, at the university, you know? Really? Yeah. I mean, that happens, you know, you've become a supervisor to somebody that you had therapy with that you, that you, that was your, I mean, I won't go into details, but oh. you know, Seattle, the therapy scene is not huge. No, it's not. Uh, yeah. You can't, you'll bump, especially if you're program director at Antioch, which is the biggest, right. Uh, I think I once calculated that if you combine all the other programs in Washington State, uh, our program is still bigger than all of them combined. Really? Yeah, Antioch is huge. The the, the counseling therapy program is, Jeez, is, I didn't know that. is huge. There's so many students and wow. so many professors, yeah. And it was bizarre for many years, even though we were gigantic, we had the same amount of core faculty as other programs did. That is bizarre. Is it yeah. still true? No, uh, it's definitely different now. Uh -huh. But in the past, just to give people an idea, a typical student to full-time faculty ratio is like 10 to one, so 10, 10 students for every one full-time faculty. Yeah. We had like 40 to one. Whoa. So it wasn't just like 50% more. It was, you know, 400% uh, out of whack. And the, yeah. the problem getting back to our talk about admin was it was administration. You know, we were going to admin and saying, uh, one, it'd be great if we had some more help. Two, we are weird. <laughs> Three, we are profitable as is and still would be if we hired, because we knew all the numbers, you know, as a program director, you, you get to know all the budgets and everything. And it doesn't take a genius to kind of calculate the tuition that's being charged and what's being paid out for of course. for salaries and benefits and stuff. And, and, you know, constant pushback until we got a uh, ad admin uh, Benjamin Pryor, who was definitely on our side oh, and right started on. actually kind of agreeing as he'd, he'd go like, what are you dealing with? And we'd be like, and he'd be like, and I, I remember he authorized me to hire, I don't know how many people, like five or six people. Wow. We only had three full-time faculty. And so I was hoping for one new person and like, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I remember him, him going like, well, let's do three, but like, you know, let's do three more in a couple of months. And I was just like, what? Like, and then it's been that, you know, trend ever since. And, you know, and over the past, I don't know, five or six years, we've hired like, uh, in, you know, originally it was three full-time faculty. I think we have like 16 now or something. Wow. Yeah. Or in that range, maybe yeah. even more. Wow. Um, which is this whole other problem because it's like, how do you manage that many full-time people and, sure. <laughs> and you have to hire them, which is a huge pain in the butt. And we have to do that all ourselves. And yeah. Um, anyway, why did I get on that topic? Uh, anonymous listener in Seattle. He oh. says, uh, I listened to your podcast on bad therapists from February 10th, 2021. I think that might've been you and me talking. Hmm. Uh, which is really interesting. Can therapy be harmful in other ways? I have a good therapist. However, mm. as our work has progressed, I've begun to feel really hurt by our work. 
I often feel deep pain and distress in therapy as he sits quietly and observes, but he seems to be unmoved by my pain. Hmm. He does not offer comfort. I can't tell what's going on inside of him, and he won't say. This inscrutability and detachment replace my childhood and adolescent to a T. Uh, my father was nearly completely detached from my feelings and mostly unresponsive when I sought his help. Is it time to say therapy is doing more harm than good? Bob, what do you think? Well, we, we can't know, but based on what's written here. So you're saying, you're saying, you know, my big thing around here is talk to your therapist about it. And what you're saying is I talked to my therapist about it and that didn't do anything. One might try again, I suppose, um, maybe be as clear. Well, what you're saying would move me if I were your therapist. If, 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 you, if you were having this experience of me and you told me about it, it would definitely have an impact on me. Um, it's impossible for us to say what's up with your therapist if they're practicing that blank slate kind of thing, which they might be. And they might be believing that what they're doing is really in service of, to you and what you're having is this experience and they might call that a transferential experience that's to be worked through or the you know right to drill knows. down on that a little bit yeah um and i think cbt there a certain brand of cbt therapist can also be like this really yeah oh, uh, man. one for the blank slate that's classical psychoanalysis and classic psychoanalysis and the idea was that and it's also I uh, guess stalt people were kind of this way, you know, mm-hmm. potentially, not all, of course. This idea that in order for therapy to be helpful, as a therapist, you have to frustrate the client on some level because you want to get at their issues and you want to decathect these all, all these you know technical things. Essentially, what you're trying to do is you're trying to provoke the client in session into a place where they have to deal with their traumas, their relational traumas. Is the way I would phrase it. That's not the way they would phrase it. Mm-hmm. And by being a Blake slate, so the you know client comes in and is looking for validation. And as a therapist, you don't provide that. You're not mean. You don't you don't devalue what the client is saying, yeah. but you also don't value what they're saying. Mm-hmm. And this pushes the client into wherever their relational traumas are. Presumably, according to this model, if you were raised well enough, you don't have relational traumas, then it won't bother you that the that the therapist is is being a blank slate. I think it would anyone. I, I think it would. <laughs> but according to their model, it at least won't be frustrating to the point where it will or create a problem. And so the idea goes is that it creates this space where the client can feel the relational traumas that they went through. As you're saying, uh, anonymous listener in Seattle, your father was detached. And so uh, this therapist who knows by providing a blank slate is pushing you into that space where you're feeling as though he's detached. Right. So you're transferring your father onto him is, is potentially the way this model would see it. Yeah. And this provides you an opportunity to wrestle with that and quote unquote work through that and to resolve it. That's that. And the idea is, is the only way to resolve it is to have it emerge and to have it analyzed, so to speak. This is a very rare form of therapy. And I'd be surprised if that's what's happening, because uh, especially in Seattle, there are hard, hardly I think this is much more of a New England thing. Yeah. And I, I think it's even rare there, too, still. But in Seattle, it's really rare to find one, a psychoanalytically oriented therapist and a psychoanalytically oriented therapist who does this blank slate work, I think is really, because most contemporary psychoanalysts are relational and would be very familiar to you and me, Bob. You know, they yeah. they, they would, uh, might even seem even more intensely compassionate and, and interested in, in the kind of interplay between client and therapist, depending. Depending. The, the other group is a certain brand of CBT therapist who just is, they're like technicians and they don't consider, kind of like how for you, Bob, if, if you, when you're teaching DBT, which is arguably a form of CBT. It is, it's CBT. Uh, officially a form of CBT? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. it's definitely CBT, yeah. The, you could imagine, and you're not like this, but you could imagine someone teaching the DBT course and being extremely detached. And just being like, you know, someone's breaking down crying and the the teacher slash therapist is like, okay, well, we're going to put that in a box for now and let's move on to the next um, uh, module. You're nodding your head. Is that, you I seen can it? imagine that happening. Have you seen it happen? 
Well, I've been around really good DBT people, but I've heard of this sort of thing happening. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't like it? No, hell no. No, it's inhumane. Mm-hmm. No, no, I'm nothing. But, but their argument would be, we don't have time for that. And that's not what this yeah. is for. Yes, understood. That, that, right. that that is actually secondary it's, to our goals and not germane and therefore to be ignored. It distracts from yeah. what the goal is, which is you have to learn skills. Right. Yeah. Which, you know, yeah. Is inhumane. I, I think it's inhumane. I wouldn't run a... And ultimately might not help, right? Because if you lose a client because they hate you or they feel humiliated or uh, they have transferred their father onto you, then what good does that do? Agreed. And it's just, how do you sleep at night? I, I wouldn't sleep well at night knowing I was being, a, in my opinion, a bad therapist. I'm yeah. not saying that this person's therapist is a bad therapist, but if I did DBT skills training the way we're talking about, blech. Right. So that's my point is that uh, for a certain brand of CBT yeah. therapists, they're so focused on the model right? and might even, and this is my ex- anecdotal experience, attracted to models like yeah. in the CBT world because, because they don't like talking about that kind of stuff. They're avoidant. Yeah. They, I, I've known uh, inst- well, colleagues <laughs> who were very adamant about going into those kinds of theories. <sighs> and my... My okay. My original assumption about like super CBT oriented people was that they were just like super evidence based or super just into the CBT model. And and I love cognitive therapy. I love behavioral therapy. It's just not my kind of primary thing. Um, so I'm not saying it's bad, but I I always thought well they they must just be really into the model. But what I found this is just my analysis of people around me was that people with tremendous relational traumas growing up are so triggered by going into that material with their clients that CBT, the model, is a safe place for them to work. That it's it's uh, uh, so much safer for them to stay in that skill-based area because if they go with their clients into that material, they themselves as therapists will also go into those places and they've learned through experience that their complex PTSD will be triggered to such an extent that they can't function in, in those spaces. Have you seen that happen? Oh yeah. I'm thinking of someone I know right now who basically operates from that place, very yeah. skills based and believes that that's by itself sufficient. Because I, they can't, because of their complex traumas. I think that that's why. Yeah. Right. Of course yeah. we can't know, but yeah. it seems that way. Right? I'm not sure that that's what they would say about themselves. I think right. that will require. Yeah. kind of insight that many people, especially folks who had that profile would not have. Right. Um, and for the record, if that's the only way one can function right. as a clinician, then go for it. You know what I mean? Like uh, it, it, you just need to understand that about yourself and maybe tell your clients yeah. and maybe pick particular kinds of clients. Yeah. You probably want to, yeah. yeah. Screen, you know, you don't want to be treating people who need a lot of corrective experiences. Right. You know? <laughs> but what I heard, what I heard Marcia say once, was that DBT and CB, DBT is a form of CBT, but the difference between DBT and CBT is that DBT has an overt focus on uh, acceptance, yeah. which, and that good CBT therapists do that, it's just not manualized. And so they tend to be warm, but that's not in their treatment manual. Right. It's not like they pretend to be validating, but that's not part of what the treatment manual says. It's just what's. Mm, indicated in human relationship that that we have a validating and warm style toward warm style toward our clients it's just not part of the cognitive behavioral manual right whereas dbt makes that very explicit yeah yeah and for the record i think there's a lot of paths to cbt and yeah. dbt there's also a lot of paths to more relational oriented attachment oriented therapies yeah so i don't want to paint this blanket um i'm just thinking of like a handful yeah. of colleagues who right. Um, you know, fit that category. Um, but I've had other colleagues who were super CBT and didn't seem to be running from something. No. It's just, they're just into it. You know, it, yeah. they like, and it works, you know, yeah. cognitive therapy works, yep. behavioral therapy works. Yep. So, uh, you know, I, I, I will say the people who don't appear to be running from something, they think of the profession as mostly that. 
that it's a profession. You yeah. know, you and I, Bob, this is a lifestyle. Yeah. This is a purpose. Yeah. This is a vocation. Uh, this is something that we do that is core to our being as a therapist. You know, when we're providing therapy, our a good portion of our soul is involved in it. You oh, know? hell yes. Yeah. And uh, a lot of our daily lives outside of working with clients is oriented towards principles that are present when we're talking to our clients. You know, just I mean? ask my wife. <laughs> right. <laughs> Whereas for some people, I think it's just a job, yeah. which is fine. You know, yeah. it's like, look, I, I go to work, I do the thing, I do the skills yep. and I provide a service. Yep. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And I go home. I, you know, I, I have a similar to, I guess, if you're a dentist, you know, it's just like, I'm not going to become attached to my mm-hmm. patients. I, right. I do a job yep. and it works a lot of the time and right. I, I do the best I can. Yep. And I have other people that I are close. I'm close to. I'm not. I'm not close to my patients. You know what I mean. Right. Whereas you could find a dentist who might be very personable and very close to their patients. So uh, anyway, it's possible that this therapist has one or both of those mindsets. It's possible. Right. Um, it makes sense to keep talking about it from my point of view. That's what I would like to suggest. Yeah, absolutely. So it, to respond to you, and I'm a listener in, in Seattle. As Bob says, talk about it's a great opportunity. And, you know, I don't know what situation you're in. I don't even, I don't know what your therapist is going through, but uh, what a wonderful opportunity for a corrective experience for you at the very least to just say, hey, I don't like the fact that you're detached. I don't like this feeling. Even if your therapist doesn't react that well to that, what a wonderful moment that you can actually speak up your voice and yeah. actually uh, validate yourself through, yeah. through that kind of. Um, you know, communication. Yeah. So, so, and if he responds and there's some work to be done there, like imagine the opportunity. I mean, it, that is maybe the core of your therapy right now. I mean, you're talking about how your dad was detached and mm-hmm. uh, was unresponsive to you when you sought his help. Yeah. Um, the other thing that could be happening is that you are distorted that right. as a client, that your therapist is uh, at least uh, sufficiently warm and attached and available and attuned, but you are distorting because of your transference, which wouldn't be the first time that's happened in therapy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but we I read about that happening. It's never uh, happened to me. Yeah. All right, Bob. Well, uh, that does it for that episode. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it.